Good afternoon. We're going to talk about patient engagement with some real world examples, I hope, and then uh, really get into a conversation about what works, what doesn't work, and then after a few minutes of the panel talking about it, we're going to open it up to questions, probably after about a half an hour or so. So let me call out our, uh, call up our panelist member, our panel members. First, we have uh, Dr. Ivor Horn, who's a pediatrician here in town at Children's National Medical Center. She's thinking about how to use social media and mobile health technology with uh, child health disparities and reaching out to a, a broad underserved community. Next, we have Brendan Roberry, who's uh, head of innovation at United Health Group. He came in from Rainy, the Rainy Twin Cities, I heard. And then uh, our, our rock star, I understood that he had dreams. <laughs> of performance early in his years, and so now we're going to let him do that, Dr. Robert Pachter uh, from Pill Jogger, the CEO. And our fourth panelist, we may have a mystery panelist, or we may just be the three of us. So anyway, we'll get it started. I thought what we would do uh, that seemed to be effective when we uh, had a conversation before the meeting was uh, try and start with some basic principles of uh, kind of how people see patient engagement, what they're trying to do with it, and where eventually they, they see it getting them and the patient. So uh, what I'd like to do first is uh, ask each of the panelists to talk about sort of what, what patient engagement means to you. So Ivor, when you think about this concept of patient engagement, well, what is it, and what is your work uh, having to do with it? I think when we talk about patient engagement, oftentimes we talk about us as the provider engaging the patient, and that's our very, I'm a pediatrician, I can say this, that's our very provider-centric perspective. But for me, when I think about patient engagement, I really think about it as being a partnership. Okay. Um, and I think about when we have that equal partnership where I'm having a conversation with, for me, it's often the parent rather than the patient, then that to me says we're engaged because we're in this together, both equally. Um, and you feel like you have just as much strength in this relationship as I do as the provider and just as much knowledge and things to give. So okay. that's patient engagement to me. Brandon, how about you? Uh, you're thinking about it in the sort of in a very big picture way at, at United, um, what, are, what are your notions about patient engagement? So, so my thoughts would echo um, what Dr. Horn said, but uh, would also say that how do we enable the patient uh, and their kind of ecosystem of caregivers to um, with all the information that they may not know or may not have at their fingertips at any given time to help them make the best decisions uh, for their health. That may be uh, helping them get the right kinds of screenings, that may be helping them with access uh, to the provider, that may be helping them understand their financials, all those things coming together in a fairly s as seamless way as possible in order to get them to, uh, to a decision point that they can make and improve their, their own health. Robert, how about you? Um, I like to think of uh, everything in humanistic terms. So I think of an engaging individual, like, uh, and that could be a physician, of course. But what does that really mean, an engaging person? It's somebody that actually captures your interest and your attention and your imagination. And I, I, so I think of it as, in, in the space that we're in, if we can do that with any of our efforts, if we can get down to the basic level of the way people interact and use that uh, strategy to um, obtain the, the result that we want, we'll, we're, we're probably better off. All right. Well, maybe you can help shed some light on what are you doing at Pill Jogger? So here's your definition and your concept of what you'd like to sort of the, the, sure. the field you're playing in. What are you trying to do specifically well, at the company? Uh, Pill Jogger is a, uh, um, it's a mobile platform for uh, adherence, so to get people to take their medicine. Uh, is the way uh, our mission started. Um, uh, what we tried to do was 
throw out any model that had been done before and look for something that would work for us. Uh, what was a strategy that we would want to see that would keep our interest in the long term because of the phenomenon of app fatigue, you know? Yeah. An, an app gets downloaded and then used for a little bit and then people stop using it. So we said, well, what, what can we do to, uh, to change the dynamic? And um, we came but up with But you wanted to do something that was an app. You just wanted to do... Well, it is an app. Yes. I mean, it's a, but uh, there's a hardware piece as well. But um, most of what we're doing is a way for uh, us to improve the lives of the users, but also to serve as a conduit now okay. for other people that want to engage with the user. And that's our, our business strategy. So okay. uh, in a... Um, so give me an example. Uh, well, our, our main focus is on the retail side. So okay. retailers, unless they're the biggest companies such as Walgreens or Walmart, et cetera, they, they don't have the, the digital department of their own. Uh, or the insurance companies um, uh, with great people like my colleague here. But uh, the retail, a lot of the retailers, particularly the mid-sized chains, the small to larger chains, um, they need a digital strategy or they will fall behind their competitors. Okay. And so uh, for those pharmacies and, and, and food stores that have pharmacies, if we do our job right in, in keeping people uh, using our app and engaged and wanting to stay on it long term, then that has value for those other players. So in some uh, areas, we have a, a project, for example, in the UAE, with, we're working with a payer there. And then a, a, um, a salt provider came onto that okay. deal. Again, they're using our platform to, to do that kind of interaction. It all depends on the model, but okay. that's, that's it. Brandon, what are, what are some of the projects that you're working on to achieve uh, patient engagement? You know, with you know, and it's probably helpful to just give quick context for United Health Group. You know, large organization. Most of you probably know us from the health benefits side of the house, which is United Healthcare. There's also another business called Optum, mm -hmm. and they do um, pharmacy benefit management. They, there's a lot of computer scientists and such looking at all the big data and bringing it down. Uh, Patient uh, education. Patient education, you know, 20 years of longitudinal data on 100, 100 million lives, et cetera, and how do you create uh, services that, that make sense for people. Some of the things we're trying to do there, as a large insurer would, we're trying to manage the population or help others manage population health. Uh, even better with programs and services to do that. So, for example, plan sponsors a large employer group or the government may uh, sponsor a, a, plan, a program for their employees uh, to enable them to take better care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And we've had some, some good successes in there, some things that are already launched in the marketplace and others uh, that are in test right now that are showing some really good results when people get engaged. I mean, there are literally billions of dollars locked up in our inability to, to engage effectively. And more important than the dollars, there's people's health that is locked up in our inability to get there. And so trying to do that. On the other side of the house, on the Optum side, there, there are new analytical tools um, that is trying to get at the same thing, both from the for the consumer as well as for the provider. I more you talked about really uh, a relationship of equals. Um, how are you, uh, between patient and doctor, how are you trying to do something different? And what is, the, what is your approach to uh, kind of cracking this patient engagement puzzle? Sure. So we've done a couple of things. In addition to being a provider, I'm also a researcher. And we went out and we looked at this question of what are some of the factors that contribute to parents being more engaged and having a stronger partnership with their provider. And one of those really key things that we discovered is something called self-efficacy. And it's really the patient feeling empowered that they can accomplish the task that's set before them, that they can actually have that interaction, they can have a conversation with their provider and get the results that they were looking okay. for. So we, we took that information and we developed a, a program. We have an asthma clinic. In our, in our hospital, basically, for families who have been coming to the emergency room, and we wanted to improve and reduce their emergency mm -hmm. room visits. So what we did was we did this really great education program that informed parents about their child's asthma, how to better manage it, and, in, and we really did improve outcomes. There was a reduction in the emergency room visits for those families who did that, and we've been doing that clinic for, for a decade now. But one of the challenges that we had was getting parents to go back to their primary care provider because we didn't want them to come to see us in the emergency right. room. 
We wanted them to go back to their primary care provider and have that interaction and let the primary care provider manage that the child's asthma going forward. Well, the problem was they, they didn't, that didn't go so well. So they stopped going to the emergency room, but they weren't making that connection with their primary care provider. And one of the big challenges was that the parents would go in and talk to their provider, but they weren't able to have an effective conversation. So what we did was we created an intervention that was really simple to really help parents be trained on how to engage with their provider. It was something very simple. And Tell us. <laughs> well, basically what we did was we taught them about the healthcare visit. What are the sections of the healthcare okay. visit and what are those things that your doctor is expected to do in every visit? When you come in, they're gonna take a history. Then they're gonna give they're gonna give you a physical and then they're gonna give you their diagnose their okay. assessment and their plan. And how do you engage with the provider in each one of those steps in a very simple way? And But those are supposed to be secrets, aren't they? I know. <laughs> But we, we, parents were really able to embrace that and they felt like they were more empowered. Oh. It didn't last for a long time. So what we did was we took a mobile phone and said, well, let's put it on your phone so that when you come to the doctor next time and you've forgotten what we taught you in that face-to-face -face visit, you can pull it up on your phone. And so that's what we've been working on now. And so we've started to implement that to see if we can't make a difference so that we can bring what we've taught families in a face-to-face -face visit into a place where they where of something okay. that they have with them at every now, visit. Did you have to prepare the doctors on the receiving end for this? You know, I'm a doctor and we have that few minutes, so I don't really prepare doctors. Okay. For me, I feel like if we can empower families to engage with providers, and research shows that if a family and a parent or a patient engages with the doctor, the doctor the doctor will engage them back. Okay. So. But so it sounds like you you had a. Uh, a teaching phase of this in the very early days to reduce the ER visits by helping the families better understand asthma and how to manage the asthma for their children or child. And that what's happened uh, in this later phase is, well, they, they did well in the emergency room interaction, but how do we now move this back to a primary care relationship? How important, you mentioned the technology piece of this, putting it on the phone, is how important do you think that is versus giving somebody a, a, you know, a checklist or trying to you know, uh, uh, get them to memorize it? I think in some ways it really is a checklist, but it's a sign of the times. It's what we use and what's ubiquitous to us now. And mm -hmm. what's ubiquitous to us now, even in the populations that I care for in underserved populations, is having a mobile phone. Okay. Because it's your connection to the outside world. And so why not use what people have? People did have a wallet where they carried around a piece of paper, but paper, pieces of paper get lost. Uh -huh. um, but you always have your phone. And did it make it more interesting or more fun, or did it did it did it help with? I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about adherence in a pharmaceutical way, but did it help the people who you've been working with kind of adhere to this approach? Uh, well, we're still we're still doing the research, so we uh -huh. don't have the data to say specifically. But I think for the parents that we've talked to, for the people who are engaged in the program they do find it more engaging. It's something that they feel like is a part of their everyday life. So it just okay. made sense. Okay. Brendan, are there some specific examples that are public enough that you can talk to us that you yeah. guys have done and that you know, maybe have worked? And then I hope we'll talk about some of the roadblocks or things where you know, maybe even back and forth here on you know, maybe what hasn't worked or what you're t t still trying to figure out. What, what would be an example of something where you know, you've said, OK, we want to reach this engagement nirvana. We've tried it here in a few areas. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. And let me give you a couple maybe that are on different parts of the spectrum, because not all patients, not all consumers are alike, right? We're very, sure. very different, and the way to engage us is very different. And uh, when I first came into healthcare and started asking the same questions that everyone else does, like, why don't I know what anything costs here? Where's the <laughs> board that can tell me if I'm going to have a knee surgery, if I'm going to have this, this, and that? Just basics of that. And I asked my doctor, and he or she has no clue either, uh, yeah. and actually can't, right? There, there's really interesting pieces with that. Well, we, we, we've launched something called My Healthcare Cost Estimator, which just basic levels of transparency. And any uh, UHC member now can actually go on the website and get a very close uh, estimate of what 
that's going to be both the facility charge, the doctor charge, all your, your various options for where you can go within an X mile radius. You control it as a consumer okay. for what, where you want to look. That actually seems pretty darn basic for every other industry that I know right. of. Right. Right? But for healthcare, wow, we, we don't have that level of transparency today. It's there today. Uh, it, it's, it's rather difficult to do with how convoluted we make healthcare and the payments and, and, and how all that works. Uh, but it's out in the marketplace now. The, the, the good and early wins are the, the feedback coming from um, both the provider side as well as the patient side that say that more than half of them actually then go on to use that data to make decisions with it uh, of where they're going to go and also how uh, they're going to, uh, to manage their health. So that's on one side. On, and in a very different population that we engage with, we have a, uh, we have uh, many millions of pregnant moms that are part of our membership, uh, both in, uh, on the employer plans as well as our, our Medicaid plans. Uh, every year, and there is always a need to engage these moms to make sure that they're getting the right prenatal care, they're caring for themselves and their baby uh, when they have the baby and then after, and sometimes that can be a struggle for okay. some moms. And we have a program called Baby Blocks, and, and you can look it up, that has been uh, pretty effective at engaging with them. And just like Dr. Horn said, uh, what do you always have with you? Well, you've got this mobile device, right? And so using text messaging and other gamification elements to say, and, and not, not only just elements on the phone, but surrounding them with a social network of folks that will help them to go do the visits, do the things you need to do, and you also get uh, rewards and things as a result has been uh, quite effective in helping to ma manage down the incidence of premature uh, babies and the costs associated with them. Okay. Robert, you, uh, I know you have an interest in gamification. Can you talk a little bit about how your uh, pill jogger approach tries to keep people from developing app fatigue and sure. instead developing drug adherence? Well, the first thing we do is uh, we try not to make it doctrinaire. We, we try to take away the health aspect of it. I think it's very important for short-term short uh, things, pregnancy and, and et cetera. And, um, there's a role for using the mobile platform to educate, certainly. but. Our job is to keep people hooked in the long term. And people in general don't like to get reminded about the, the side effects of their medicine or, or the disease process that they have, that they, have, uh, they know that they're supposed to take the medicine uh, and they choose not to. So our simply reminding most of the people, other than a small uh, cohort that are just a little forgetful or busy, but they're very motivated. Most people kind of know. So we, we threw that all away and then we, um, looked at the gamification idea of giving points for prizes and things, and that, that works also, but there's a sundown on the effect of that. that uh, Colleen McCorney of, of Merck showed that. Uh, eventually, people kind of get fatigued of that as well, and they're getting points from so many people. So we said, well, what can we do that would really capture somebody uh, and keep them, keep their attention. We said, well, let's give away a car. Let's give away a Mercedes Benz or a Ford F10 pickup truck. Let's give away a Four Seasons Vacation. Let's give away <laughs> Tiffany Diamonds. Let's really turn up the notch. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, the model is shown in Powerballs, for example, where the, the value goes up and everybody's lining up on the street, you know, with their paycheck. And the reporter said, what are you going to do with the money? Everybody has, for sure, <laughs> I'm going to buy my mother a house. So I'm going to pay off my college. Okay, there is a fantasy element that you can tap into for a, not a nefarious purpose, but a good purpose. Yeah. And so that actually turns out to be our business case. That without going into the detail right now, but uh, the ability to, um, to have that kind of transactions on the platform. And we, we also use it in other kind of uh, interesting ways where if somebody doesn't respond to a reminder, uh, they get what's called a game piece. The game piece for that prize goes into their drawer with a big X. So they, they just lost the ability to go to Hawaii on a dream vacation with their family. So with, you know, we're really trying to um, capture people's imagination and then very gently over time intersperse a little bit about health and about you know, why they're on the medicine, but not make it you know, every single day. Just, just first get their attention and, um, 
and it, you know, we're, we're not live yet, but we have implementations with uh, some pretty big names in process. So. so so, these prizes you mentioned, I could still qualify? I could you could still, as long as you don't work for Pell Jogger, you <laughs> yeah. know, there are sweepstakes regulations in America. We're not a sweepstakes. We're kind of somewhere between a, a lottery and a sweepstakes because you need points and prizes. And it, it's not complicated, but uh, be that as it may, there are rules. Yeah. And uh, it has to be no purchase necessary, which works for us because we also didn't tie uh, quid pro quo. We didn't say you have to sh say you're taking your medicine to be eligible to get the, the points or the, the game pieces, that kind of thing. Because, we, you know, quid pro quos end after the, the offer uh -huh. is over. So we wanted there to be kind of a habituation into the process of taking your pill. And we also intersperse exercise and other things like that. But. Um, if we can habituate rather than compel it, I think then we get that golden intrinsic motivation that, that we're looking for. That's so the, the so you're, you're live or not live? You're still... Well, we have a live app on the iTunes app store. It's free. It's called Pill Jogger Live because it's not hosted. And anybody can use it to put in their own medicines and such. And you'll see how the process works with game, four game pieces and points. Okay. And, and you win uh, these w uh, virtual prizes. But um, it, doesn't give, it doesn't have all the bells and whist whistles. The, the implementations are going to happen in 2014. It takes a certain amount of time to go through the, the structures of, of large companies, and it also takes, there's a, the business side has to be put together such we provide our solution without cost to everybody, to okay. the retailers, to payers, whoever. We're, so we're, but we're, what's your business. business model then? What's the business model? Yeah. Well, we call them advertisements. Okay, so when, we, when somebody <laughs> uh, responds, they get a game piece that is good for the uh, uh, yellow Mustang convertible. Okay, now there's a difference between wanting to sell you something, which is what an advertisement is, and wanting to give you something for simply doing something for yourself that you're supposed to do okay. anyhow. That's the, the madman behavioral psychologist. In me. So um, <laughs> that actually has value to the vendor who wants to reach that person. Okay, Ford Motor Company or the Four Seasons or whatever. And so for that, we charge them a fraction of a cent. And it's better than that because they can tap on it and see if the individual really wants to see this car that they're going to win, then they can tap on it and see rich media advertisements or, or whatever else. It goes into their drawer. It stays in their drawer for the game cycle, which is typically 90 days. And then the game resets and there are four of them a year. So those advertisements, if you will, uh, add up in a year's time to a significant amount of money, about seven bucks in that range. And so uh, if we target 1,000 pharmacies with 500 to 1,000 members per pharmacy, then we're up into the range where we can pay everything. We can give all the prizes, which we have to do by sweepstakes law anyhow. In Abu Dhabi, we're giving away a Ferrari, so that, that I think will get a little bit of attention. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, it seems to all fit together almost like, um, what's the word, alchemy? Because there's <laughs> nobody loses. <laughs> all right. So one question that I had in, in the examples that we heard, um, they're in various stages of launch or part underway. Kind of where, where do you see this in the near future? Where, where would you like it to be? And um, how will you know, for instance, the, the sweet spot of patient engagement when you, when you hit it. So you've each talked about what your goals are and how you're starting down that road. What, what, what is it, Ivor, for you that you'll know, okay, we've, this is where we want to be and this is what it looks like? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to step back a little bit because in my role as a pediatrician, I see children as a prime opportunity um, to train a future generation of engaged patients in a way that we've never had before because we can take things like gamification not necessarily in um, in advertisement I think is what, <laughs> um, in in that form but really taking the opportunity to use games to educate, particularly kids with chronic conditions, about, and in health and wellness, engaging kids and educating them about what it means to be healthy and how to, and also how to manage their conditions so that they're informed and then developmentally they change, so you have to change what you give them as okay. it goes forward. And so by the time they become young adults, they're well, they're knowledgeable 
and they already have a behavior because they've learned it through gaming where they're well prepared to take on that task as adults and it's become part of their um, DNA. It's second become, nature for them. It's become point. second nature for them, just like using the internet is second nature for our kids. And I think that's in a PowerPoint presentation for my daughter's joke, whereas for me it's still a challenge. Um, so I think I think that's really imp a really important way for us to think about engagement. And when I, for me as a pediatrician, when I see people engaging throughout the lifespan, engaging kids to become empowered patients and empowered parents. I feel like that's when we've reached um, a great place. For now, at this point now, when I have a patient or a parent who comes in and they are knowledgeable and they have tools and they're challenging me, that's... That, that's you like that? Th that's my job. I, I don't have all the yeah, answers, yeah. but my job is to for you to come to me with questions and when you when you're ready when you're challenging me that tells me you are engaged with your health okay. and you're empowered to do so okay so that's great you that, know that type of gamification is incredibly effective for um for educating much much more effective than just things that reading people instructions and stuff to for, okay. particularly for kids um it's a great thing you're doing. Yeah, I think you just laid out the, the future I think we all want to see with that. I think for me, with, with healthcare, in my mind, um, still playing catch up on the engagement front versus mm -hmm. kind of other industries that we think of. Uh, if, if we can get to the point of uh, we as patients, we as consumers, uh, having the information, the transparency, the ability to be as engaged in everything from from pricing to knowledge so I can go and challenge my doctor if, if I choose to do that or seeking uh, all different types of care if we, as we go about reaching that point, that's where I see engagement going and that's where I would, would uh, maybe nirvana is not the right word, but uh, at that point where we have the opportunity to engage and then and that people will engage I think in different ways just like we do in other aspects of our lives. What will be the payoff for you or what will be the why will it matter when you get there? What will you be looking to achieve? Well, I think it'll matter tremendously because we know that, that much of, so just take the cost for example, um, much of the cost is driven on for what we do, how we behave, mm -hmm. our lifestyle choices that we make. And at least if we have visibility to what that is, we may make some different choices. Sometimes maybe we won't and sometimes we will, but at least we have the opportunity to do such. And, uh, and, and those who most of us either are now or will be caregivers for someone in our life, both older than us and or younger than us, that level of information and knowledge and, and not, only, not always just having to go to one particular source for that I think is going to become increasingly important and something that we're going to find is, is increasingly there. And then how are we going to engage in that kind of world? It's going to be neat. Good point. Robert, any, any ideas on your end of sort of where you'd like this to be in a the few years' point? time? Uh, well, I left practice of medicine because, you know, almost three years ago I saw that smartphones were going to be the vehicle to reach people. And um, when I told people that I left practice as an interventional radiologist to go into the smartphone business back then, they thought <laughs> I was out of my mind. And they were probably right, actually. But, um, for me, the end point will be success, that we really do show, and we can measure that easily. Our first pilot looks at per persistency, which for those un un unused to the um, um, definition, uh, it means just refilling prescriptions. Okay. okay. And so you can look at three months and six months and nine months and 12 months and, and look at what the uh, persistency rate is. And if we're making a difference, and we're really focused on, on the, the big, uh, kahuna, okay, the um, diabetes, number one, the, okay. the drug that we're working with, a, a, a big pharma company, is a, a new type 2 diabetes drug. Then hypertension and asthma, COPD. I mean, if we just got people to take medicines for these diseases, they will live longer, they'll be happier, and uh, they won't cost as much to the healthcare system. So for me, that would be a great uh, opportunity. And then the second thing is called an exit which uh, happens with all startups, and uh, that would make me even happier. Got it. <laughs> I, 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 think we're, I think the important thing is that we're improving health outcomes. 
um, both in management of chronic conditions where people are living better, healthier lives, and that they are taking control of that process. And to be able to take control, you really need to have knowledge, and you need the tools to be able to apply that knowledge. And I think that's the important part of patient engagement. It's giving people knowledge, educating people, informing people, and then giving them the tools to act on that information, um, to be a part of that partnership. As providers, we have a lot of work to do in changing the way that we think and our mindset and how we practice and what our role is in that partnership. But I think there's a new generation of providers that coming forward that embrace that process and embrace being a partner with their patients and with the families and recognizing that we're really one piece of a really big ecosystem that people live in. Um, and recognizing what our role is and how we can facilitate and improve our role in that ecosystem. So is part of what you're saying that there's a generational issue or issues on the provider side that you're trying to figure out and work with? I would get in a lot of trouble if I said that. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> but you said it. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I think it's not, I think, I think it's not just gen a generational. I think, it's, I think it's a mindset because anyone in any generation can have that mindset of partnership. And I, um, and I think it's important when people embrace that. My, um, I'm a caregiver for my parents as well because I have elderly parents. And they have providers that embrace that partnership. Because as you can well imagine, having um, one of your patients have a provider as a child can be very challenging because I'm going to question things that other people don't question. Um, and you I'm are a pill jogger. Uh, yeah, and I'm going <laughs> and I'm and I'm, and I'm to challenge your decisions in yeah. a way that I feel like is going to be best for my parents and for my um, for my family. And I think that's really important. And and their and their providers embrace that experience and share with me. Um, and we work together as a team, and I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, um, one of the little talked about provisions of the ACA, the final regs in October, allows for wellness campaigns that lower uh, the individual mandate contribution. So for the first time, uh, a fan of uh, self-determination, self-responsibility, finally into the healthcare system. Um, Safeway Health is quoted as having had an influence in uh, that. For those that are familiar, they, uh, for their non-union employees, they said if you quit smoking or lose weight, you probably have initiatives of, I'm sure, uh, United. Uh, and they are very effective. If you give people a stake in, in the business, you know, they'll, they'll behave better. Mm -hmm. um, now, the original um, part of that was that if you were a smoker, you would pay higher rates. And that created a firestorm of controversy. So uh, they said, OK, you can get a rebate, a refund a on you your a discount if you, if you stop smoking, as, as measured by some lab tests. And I think you know, we fall into that ecosystem as well. There hasn't been the emphasis on medicine adherence. It's a little creepy again, but you know, I mean, I think that there has to be personal responsibility for us to really move the needle um, in managing healthcare costs. Yeah. Be before we throw it open to questions, I wanted to ask one more thing, which was, uh, are there any particular barriers or hurdles that you're grappling with? You know, we we see the vision, we hear about some of the experiments, we've heard about some of the uh, successes that you've had so far. What are the what are the hard things that you still have to crack or that are really holding you back from getting you where you want to be? I, I would say, um, for me, there are, there are a couple of things. For underserved populations, a lot of my patients don't feel like they have the right to ask the question. They don't feel, um, they don't feel like they have the right to question me. And when I sit down and I say, I'm not leaving until all of your questions are asked until you understand. I said, and I and I give this rule. I said, even if my hand is on my hand is on the knob of the door, and there's something you don't understand, please stop me. Um, and when they go to see, I'm a pri I'm a primary care provider, and I say, when you go to see a subspecialist, and if you, if you walked out of that door and you didn't get what they were saying, 
please come back to me so that we can make sure that you get it next time or so that I can go to them and get the answer okay. that you need. And I think really in, in the sense of we're giving people tools and we're, we're creating these tools, but really working with especially populations that don't feel empowered. Elderly populations have the same issue. There's this culture. They, they didn't come up in a culture where you questioned the doctor. Um, and creating that space and that education and that ability for them to ch make that culture change to say, yes, it's OK. And that's part of my job as a provider, to say, yes, it's OK to question me. Um, but I think we really have to work on that culture shift in the community as, at the same time. Brennan, how about uh, you? I, well, I, I just think we want all our kids to go to Dr. Horn's practice <laughs> after that. My goodness, I know I do. I'm going to fly him out here <laughs> yeah. make that happen. Uh, for me, it's, it's um, really focused around kind of the convoluted lack of transparency of information mm -hmm. uh, so that we can in, engage uh, in the way we need to and want to to, mm -hmm. to enable our, our better health, whether that be around costs, whether that be around uh, treatment paths, whether it be around different conditions, et cetera, so that folks can engage just like they do in um, other, other parts of their life. And Robert? Well, my perspective is now as a startup, and um, you know, it, it's, it's a long road from being a, a, a respected member of society as a doctor in a, in a formal practice to sitting with the lettuce salesman in the reception room of, uh, of the stores waiting my turn to talk to somebody that might have an interest in my, uh, in my product. Mm -hmm. And um, at the beginning, uh, it, it's a very steep climb because you have no way of, of validating that you actually know what you're talking about or that your product has some efficacy. And um, particularly, as I said before, the, the bigger companies all have their own digital departments that have some uh, insular nature and don't want outside uh, ideas and such. Mm -hmm. But um, finally, we we found the, uh, the by eliminating all barriers to entry, that is by by the fact that my company pays the cost for for implementations, um, we're, we we st started seeing traction and then belief. Great. All right. Well, we're going to take some questions now from the audience. Um, I think somebody will walk around with a microphone. It's really hard for me to see, but I see a hand there. If you just tell us who you are. Sure. Hi, Dr. Richard Singerman, and I'm a co-founder of TrustNet MD. We provide evidence-based collaboration tools for, for evidence-based medicine. And uh, we were fortunate, we, in partnership with Johns Hopkins, just won an HHS award for using social network networks for interacting with community health care workers. So my question is specifically around them because they are mentioned in the, in the uh, Affordable Care Act as a key facilitator for ground zero uh, healthcare interactions. So I was wondering, especially in the physician from, from Children's, but also with, with Pill Jogger, and actually all, all three of you, how you see these kind of ancillary providers, these people that kind of play a buffering role. I mean, sometimes it's the, it's the family member who's doing this role, sometimes it's a, it's a community healthcare worker, the people that have a, a little bit of healthcare education, but really are at that ground zero helping to drive compliance. If you could kind of talk about them, that'd be great. I, I think it's really vital. I think it's a very important um, connection to have sort of uh, experts in patient navigation. We have a patient navigation program at Children's National where we have parents of kids with chronic conditions who are experts at navigating the system. I wish I had somebody to help me navigate the system. It's so complex. Um, and having, having someone who's been in your shoes to some degree versus me as a provider, because I, I look at it, you know, I have my provider perspective, and then as the caregiver of parents, I have my caregiver perspective. But really, when I'm in that provider role, I'm looking from my provider lens and having someone who can work with you through the system who is a part of that system and who can help you to navigate it, I think is critical um, in moving forward. And I think we should support them more and more. 
Yeah, we actually have some initiatives going on right now around uh, healthy communities as well as caregivers in general in the kind of the broadest sense of that word uh, because there's been a renewed emphasis on how critical that is going forward. Uh, so we're putting you know, people's time and dollars and uh, focus on those very issues. I think they're critical. And we rely on the mobile side. So we can, the nice thing about mobile is you can target it specifically to the user demographic or the disease process. And so uh, this will be a little bit down the line, but we have a, a project specifically designed for adolescents with the prize structure completely different for, for that and appropriate for that level and uh, an interface so they feel part of a, a, of a group and can feel the um, support of that group. I'm, I'm Jim, Gro Jim Grovner. I'm uh, the CEO of Balance Business Advisors. We're a consultancy. And um, we've been working with companies that are focused on uh, enhancing engagement of inpatient situations, where you've got patients in the hospital. Uh, even today and in the past, they felt very much like everything's done to them. Uh, it's very difficult for them to understand what's going on. And in fact, as they get the information at discharge, they usually forget it, and uh, you know they don't adhere to, the, and so they end up with readmissions. So I guess my question is mostly to Brandon, I guess, or Dr. Horn as well. Um, and uh, you know, what have you seen that's really been effective, if anything, in working with the inpatient population? And how how important do you think that is? Because most of the conversation today has been about engaging patients at the time they meet their physicians in an outpatient environment or as they're um, basically taking care of themselves in the, in the general population. So I guess my question is, how important is the inpatient patient engagement? What have you seen that's been effective or have you seen anything that's effective? And I guess those are the two questions. Good, so to answer the question, yes, it is uh, very important. Um, yeah. It, th there's a lot of uh, stuff out there, and unfortunately, most of it has to do with just making a copy of a copy of a copy of something else and giving it to the patient when they're confused and drugged up anyway. And yeah, that, that's real effective. Um, so it, I guess it's a low bar um, to put it to put it mildly. Um, I have seen some things that I think are are moving in the right direction. Uh, there's and and those have to do with richer media in terms of understanding. Those have to do with. Uh, creating the, um, a platform for caregivers, not just the patient, but the, the son, the daughter, the mother, whomever who is, who is playing those roles, so they will know, and not if they don't have the chance to be in the hospital with them, they can know after the fact what's happening, and using media such as audio and video to actually explain time and time again what, what we need to do as patients, and, and, uh, and then uh, what we are planning to ex uh, planning on expecting, what, excuse me, I'm not saying that right, uh, what's expected of us as patients in order to engage in the recovery process after you get there. I haven't seen a lot of it done well yet, but I know that there's some, some best-in-class uh, hospital systems that are starting to put that into place. One, because I think they're, they have a lot of incentive to do such, because they don't want to see people get come back in the hospital uh, with some of the penalties that happen there, but also just for from, from flat out, that's, it's just the right thing to do, and we now have the technology and uh, process to do it. Uh, yes, um, uh, David Craze, uh, I'm a medical entrepreneur, and, and uh, we had an exit uh, IPO 13 years ago with a blood analyzer company that we had, and uh, I'm also a certified medical practice executive and fellow of American College of Healthcare, Exec Healthcare Executives, so I've kind of see things from that prism. Um, so often, well, you mentioned earlier that you're giving away a Ferrari in Abu Dhabi. Um, so often we see things in the U.S. perspective, but patients are universal. And we know that uh, some of the greatest pre penetration of health on a mobile platform is being delivered in Nigeria and Kenya. Um, what do you see best practices internationally that might be able to be adopted in the U.S. that haven't bubbled to the surface yet? Who's it directed to? Probably no more than me. So it, it, we, we do have a, a fair bit of international business. Um, one of the neat things internationally is they're kind of <clears throat> skipping over the whole telecom bit and just going right to mobile. Uh, some of some of the practices using there uh, have to do with that's that is just the way of communicating. Um, you see kids that that are barely clothed, but yet they're carrying around their cell phones. 
uh, with them, and they and they know how to transmit micropayments, and they know how they know when people are coming, and so the ability to contact them and communicate with them is there. I think there's it's it's still a ways before we have good best practices we can port back to the United States, given the, the infrastructure and everything that we've got. But we know that from a communication standpoint, there's a lot going on that, that works really well. We know that from a community involvement and broader ecosystem of caregivers standpoint, there's a lot that we can learn there as well. So th those two things, I think, are on the kind of the cutting edge that we could we could bring back and frankly do a much better, you know, do as good as they're doing and, and probably enhance it as well. Far away. Hi, Mike Squires from Blueprint Healthcare IT. So Will you spoke about cultural change. So how do we impact or make the cultural change among the physicians to get involved in patient engagement? What can we do? What's being done? Um, if I can speak to that, uh, I was approached by two hypertension societies in Europe uh, about using the platform because they wanted to use it as a vehicle for their physicians to engage their patients and to uh, measure their um, response to medications. I didn't even know practicing medicine for almost 25 years how bad adherence is, about 50%, worldwide maybe down in some respects to 30%. So all the studies that were done, as you well know, uh, on hypertension and meds were uh, corrupted by the fact that people weren't really taking their medicines and, and it wasn't measured that they were taking their medicines. So um, the hypertension societies, I think, really see the opportunity. And so for us, that's a great thing if they want to use our platform. We, uh, as I say, we, we, we'd give it, be happy to give it to them. We just need to find out a way to, to work with some co-partners um, on the retail side or in the pharma side. That's in process. I, th I think the research on healthcare communication shows that when patients um, ask more questions, when they have more, di when they engage their providers more, the providers respond in kind. In 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 many ways, I think taking that opportunity to empower patients and families and caregivers to engage the provider. Um, and, and it's not a matter of sort of putting the onus on the patient to do it. It's recognizing that the providers will respond in will respond to that engagement. Um, and I think we I think we do need to work on training our providers to be more effective at listening and sitting down, um, and recognizing that this is a partnership as opposed to a dictatorship. Um, but that, I, and we have to, but we have to do those two things together. Ironically, it's the EHRs that's becoming more of a wedge between <laughs> the patient and their uh, caregiver. I think we have one question. Gentlemen here, here. gentlemen here. Um, why is my fire uh, M3? In our projects, we found that including the patient and sharing information with them is the beginning for them to ask questions back. Normally it's take and take. So maybe when the hospital leave the hospital, you get a big disclaimer of what to do, but that means you have useful information, maybe one page of 30 useful yeah. So how do you create this dialogue by giving me, the patient, something that I can look at, I can get educated, I can respond to, I can you know, give you data back. So when you talk to home, you're talking about this dialogue mm -hmm. and, you know, about HRs being you know, walls, and it's really it's a question of when does the patient slice, which is what this engagement means. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's not about doctors. It's, it's about getting the patient from the bottom up, maybe, mm -hmm. to run in line. Because we found that uh, once you give the patient something, you can't really shut them. They're, they're there. Whether they want or not. Yeah. I, I, th I think, I, yes, I, yes, I agree. We, patients need their data. People need their information. They also need how they need to be able to interpret it. And we need to, we, our job is to help you translate what, what that data is and what, you know, what that data means. Um, 
and for you to be able to ask the questions because amazingly you're giving me lots of information when you walk into the door you are the expert on you I am just the translator in a lot of ways and my job is to translate to you all of this you know I, I take my medical knowledge and what I went to medical school for and I my job is to translate back to you you've given me this information what I understand from what you've told me is this this is what the data shows this is what your lab show and this is the information back to you now let's work to now that you've got the information I've got the information now let's work together and come up with that assessment and plan we call it a soap note it's subjective objective assessment plan what you tell me what the data tells me and what are what we come to the agreement of I bring to you my medical knowledge and my expertise you bring to me your patient expertise and then we come up with a plan that works and improves outcomes does that think, seem reasonable I think we'll we'll <laughs> Okay, very okay. last question, very quick, and we'll have a quick response and wrap it. Right. My name is Pat Kittler. I publish acadigest.org. But my question has to go to, go to uh, Dr. Pachter's uh, mentioning of the wellness programs under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it's my opinion, and I think it's a, a common opinion, that we're never going to control health care costs until patients start taking care of their health. Money motivates. Why are insurance companies and employers so reluctant to share the benefits of wellness programs with the patient? Can you when you say share the benefits of wellness programs with the patient? Well, if you look at if you look at good wellness programs like the one at Lincoln Industries, for instance, or if you look at the South Central Foundation in Alaska, if you engage the patient in their own wellness and they take charge of keeping themselves healthy, you can cut health care costs by more than 50%. And that's certainly what we need to do. Now, those are wellness programs, and you can design them. They've been designed very successfully. Yep with as much as 15 to 1 return on investment. Some of that money should go back to the patient. Mostly the patients are paying for that insurance one way or the other. And uh, what I have found in my limited ability to analyze the problem is that the reason it's not happening is that employers, if there's a savings on premium, want to put it in their pocket. Okay, I think we get, the, we get to the point where a little money. over time. Does anybody have a quick response? So, quick, quick well, response. I want to know why that why why don't money motivates people to participate in programs. It sure does. Right. Actually, United Healthcare has a personal rewards program that does that very thing. To answer very specifically, really quick, and it, it actually employers and, and employees can choose how they want those rewards to happen. Uh, but there are programs out there like that. That one's actually pretty darn successful. It, it, it's open to millions of people right now. Does it okay. Uh, the employer chooses for their employee population how that works. Sometimes it's money off premiums next year, sometimes a reward. It, it really depends on what yep. they choose. Okay. Well, thank you all for your attention, and thanks to Ivor and Brandon and Robert for what I think was a really terrific panel. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>